Hello, my name is Tony. This was John Carpenter's second film as director. Made in 1976, it followed his eccentric, shoestring-budgeted cult science fiction debut, Dark Star, in 1974, and set him on the road to make an escape from New York, Halloween, and his magnum opus, The Thing. Not only is it one of the best movies of the 70s, it's also one of the best movies ever made. There he goes, overstating the praise again, you may think, just because it's something he's got the hots for. It's small, it's cheap, it was made in a rush, no well-known actors in it, didn't exactly set the world on fire financially. What's so great about it? Well, everything. That's what's so great about it. Motherfucking everything. In an ideal world and under ideal circumstances, I'd kick back and chill out, reviewing just about every film John Carpenter ever did. Even on his worst days, he turned in movies that were better and way more entertaining than most of today's CGI codependent wunderkinds at their oatmeal milk latte guzzling best. He was a skilled craftsman who utilised his influences and inspirations with creativity, consideration and deep respect. He was in love with the classic old-school filmmaking of the likes of Howard Hawks and Alfred Hitchcock, and applied the gist of that affection to inform and shape his own work as one of the new breed of his generation. It goes without saying, but it isn't an ideal world and circumstances don't allow me the luxury of unfettered self-indulgence, much as I'd like them to. Still, as he made some of my most personally beloved and highly rated movies of all time, I feel I need to do something to at least acknowledge that fact. Assault on Precinct 13 was the first of his films I saw, catching up with Dark Star when it was screened on BBC Two some years later. Precinct took my breath away, knocked me off my feet, thrilled the living shit out of me. I went in with no expectations and left feeling as uplifted and satisfied as I have ever felt leaving a cinema. Something only the magic of a truly great film can achieve. Or a truly great f- so I think it's as good a place as any to make something of a start. Originally, Carpenter wanted to produce a western, one inspired by Hawke's masterful Rio Bravo, but he couldn't raise a budget that would stretch to it. So, taking the core idea of a small band of protagonists in a restricted environment with limited resources, isolated and under siege from superior external forces, he reimagined it as an urban cop movie. In place of the jailhouse in Rio Bravo, he gave us a police station in an almost abandoned city district. It's in the process of closing down for the last time. There's a skeleton crew supervising the closure overnight, and a relentlessly implacable and murderous street gang outside wanting to get in and willing to do whatever it takes. That's the thumbnail scenario. Here's the expanded version. In South Central LA, street gang Street Thunder has stolen a shitload of guns and ammunition. Some of their members are up to no good when armed LA police ambush and blow away six of them. The remaining brothers, of which there are many, the membership benefits must be something else, take a blood oath and swear revenge. Newly promoted Police Lieutenant Ethan Bishop, Austin Stoker, is assigned the thankless task of taking temporary charge of the Anderson Police Precinct, a defunct decommissioned station in the process of shutting up shop for good. The only other staff on duty are Desk Sergeant Cheney, Henry Brandon, and Secretaries Lee, Laurie Zimmer, and Julie, Nancy Loomis. Across town, four armed members of Street Thunder cruise around a decrepit suburban neighbourhood looking to find people to randomly kill. They arouse the suspicions of ice cream man Peter Bruni, which is something of a turnaround in that it's usually ice cream men who arouse suspicions. He watches as they curb crawl around. Unfortunately for him, they're aware of his attentions, and the leader shoots him dead, as well as a rather unlucky little girl, Kathy Kim Richards, who returns to his truck because he served her with the wrong ice cream. Wrong dessert flavour and bullet in the sternum on the same day. Hell of a short straw. Should have stuck with what you had, kid. Regular vanilla's good. Moral is, don't be a picky eater. The girl's father, Lawson Martin, West finds the ice cream guy's gun and blows the leader away with it. The remaining gang members chase him down. He makes it to the Anderson precinct in shock and a semi-catatonic state and unable to give an account of himself. A prison bus commanded by Starker Charles Cyphers is on its way to the state pen. On board a convicted death row murderer Napoleon Wilson, Darwin Joston, and fellow cons Wells, Tony Burton and Cordell Peter Franklin. When Cordell falls ill, Starker directs the driver Gilman Rankin to the nearest precinct to arrange medical assistance, and it just so happens to be Anderson. Shortly after their arrival, the street gangs cut the phone lines and the power and lay siege to the building with extreme prejudice. The rest of the film is a thrilling onslaught of hard-bitten and suspenseful gunplay, mayhem, violence and bruising action as them that's inside stand up against them that's outside and try to survive the night until help arrives.
if help arrives. Assault on Precinct 13 is so good it's unreal. Things that make it so a Carpenter's piano wire taut and highly polished screenplay and direction, accommodating the playful and pugnacious character development. This is in synchrony with a rare panache and confidence in executing the big moments and the well-positioned subtle little touches that spark with the electricity of self-awareness whilst bestowing upon the audience crispy unexpected jolts of shock and wry amusement. Some of the crackling dialogue, deadpan, waspish and hard-boiled often feels like it was lifted from either a 40s detective flick or a 50s western, yet has that snappy modern tone which keeps it sounding fresh. Douglas Knapp's cinematography is mightily influenced by the expressionist style of the noir movies of the 40s, featuring razor-sharp assimilations of light and shade. The original and earlier prints were grainier, whereas the newer Blu-ray version is much brighter and sharper with everything more clearly defined. The camera work is quite beautiful, finding a willing partner in the incisive and often rapid cut editing, which was undertaken by Carpenter himself under the alias John T. Chance, the name of the John Wayne character in Rio Bravo. Then there's the narcotic level addiction of the score, composed by Carpenter in just three days and categorised by him as being influenced by Lalo Schifrin's work on Dirty Harry and Led Zeppelin's The Immigrant Song. Once heard, its pulsing electronic chord progression is never forgotten. Later, it formed the basis of the track Mega Blast, Hip Hop on Precinct 13 by Bomb the Bass, which was in turn adapted for use in the Bitmap Brothers Amiga shoot 'em up Xenon 2 Mega Blast, arguably the most innovative and integral use of pop music in a video game up to that point. You could be forgiven for thinking the primary actors Austin Stoker, Laurie Zimmer and Darwin Joston would have gone on to have stellar acting careers. The stars didn't align that way and it never came to pass, but their work here is the stuff of legend. Stoker, who plays Ethan, same Christian name as John Wayne's character in The Searchers coincidentally or not, was the most well known at the time. He'd been prominently featured in some black exploitation movies, The Zebra Killer, Abby, Sheba Baby and some higher profile big studio films fodder like Battle for the Planet of the Apes and Airport 1975. He is the modern equivalent of a western lawman, thrust into a siege situation and struggling to take charge, to take the lead and take control. Ultimately, he's a man of action, blessed with a clear idea of honour, duty and doing the right thing. When Julie realises that Street Thunder want Lawson and suggests handing him over, he's not having that. He's going to protect and serve, no matter how it works out, just like the Duke himself would have. Great character, top-rate performance from Stoker. But he's pipped to the post by the taciturn, dead-eyed, faintly quizzical, darkly amused and philosophically prosaic killer Napoleon Wilson, in whom Ethan must place his trust. Darwin Joston as the best written character of the piece and the best dialogue, repeatedly asking of anyone and everyone, have you got a smoke? Got a smoke? Got a smoke? Anybody got a smoke? and react into any suggestions or plans with Can't argue with a confident man. Can't argue with a confident man! Quotable one-liners come thick and fast. He was based on the Charles Bronson character Harmonica in Once Upon a Time in the West. Justin is a revelation, projecting a complex character who is composed under pressure, capable, explosively violent in a languid, matter-of-fact way, emotionally chilled with flickers of flinty humanity sparking up every so often. It's a career-best performance in a career that never went anywhere. Reportedly, he got the gig as he was Carpenter's next-door neighbour and looked right for it. He certainly was that. That. Running him a close second is Laurie Zimmer as the bruised, careworn secretary Lee, christened after Lee Brackett, writer of the screenplay for Rio Bravo. She's a super cool, attractive, zesty amalgamation of any number of Howard Hawke's female leads – Catherine Hepburn, Anne Dvorak, Rosalind Russell, Barbara Stanwyck, Angie Dickinson. Inarguably feminine, smart, smoulderingly sexy, resourceful, and more than willing and able to blast away with a forty-five when the chips are down. She's also drawn to men with something of a darker side, in this case Napoleon. Their relationship and interactions of a great chemistry, as if they share an instinctive understanding of each other and are equally fatalistic regarding their potential futures. Zimmer plays her beautifully, and I would have loved to have seen her in more subsequent roles, but she was not particularly enamoured of the movie acting world and quit to become a teacher. Of the supporting cast, Charles Cyphers, who would become something of a carpenter regular, shines as the hard-nosed escort officer Starker. An ex-boxer, Tony Burton, makes 
Duke's mark as Convict Wells. He would go on to take the recurring role of Tony Duke Evers in all the Rocky movies up until and including Rocky Balboa in 2006. The gang members are deliberately represented as inhuman. They hardly speak, move like automatons, register limited emotions, behave like ants controlled by a hive mind with a suicidal mob mentality. Carpenter based them in part on Romero zombies, only of course they move faster and with more deliberation. They're truly scary. Their delivery of the cholo to the precinct, a blood oath that means they don't care about their own survival, adds another layer of spine-tingling tension to the proceedings. There are some definitive shock moments in this picture, insightfully and stylishly implemented for maximum emotional effect. The killing of Kathy is one such instance of high-powered awe inducement. The gang warlord hardly looks at her, just stands side on, levels his silenced pistol and blows her away. When I first saw it, I was genuinely taken by surprise. I mean, she's just a kid, right? Kids don't die like that in films? Well, now they do, taboo subject or not. And it effectively illustrates in no uncertain terms what the protagonists are dealing with. An earlier manifestation of the nature of pure evil, Carpenter would explore further in Halloween with the character of Michael Myers. Set pieces come with meaning and purpose, littered with nuances and subtleties. When a sustained hail of silent bullets is fired into the precinct, those inside duck for cover. It goes on for ages, blinds and windows ripped and shattered, walls and objects raked incessantly. When there's a brief pause in the attack and you think it's all over, one final shot hits a sheaf of papers, flinging them into the air, like a full stop to the assault, or maybe an exclamation mark. When Wells sneaks outside through a sewer pipe in a tense and suspenseful scene, emerging from a manhole, he manages to get into a car and start it up. It looks to both the audience and those inside the precinct like he's getting away. A gangbanger rises from the back seat behind Wells as he drives. Cut back to the precinct where a gunshot is heard. Now we share in their dismay and despair because Carpenter has so cleverly immersed and invested us in the story and the characters by this point. Everything is set up and executed with sharp emotional intelligence power in it. Of course, there's a climactic shootout with Team Street Thunder overrunning the station and Team Ethan Bishop retreating down a narrow basement corridor behind a large metal sign used as a makeshift barricade. Running out of ammo and places to run to, all that Ethan can do is aim with his rifle for a tank full of acetylene gas. After missing twice, Napoleon ironically observes... Will his final bullet strike the mark, detonate the tank and obliterate the gang members? What you reckon? All I can tell you for sure is that the cavalry arrives just in time to be too late. Like it matters by then? John Carpenter got to make his western his homage to Rio Bravo and his hero Howard Hawks. Only it turned out to be masquerading under the guise of an urban police thriller set in 70s LA. But make no mistake, Assault on Precinct 13 is a western. The protagonist could be isolated in a jailhouse in Tombstone with roughneck gunslingers laying siege outside or trapped in a fort attacked by a war party of Apache Braves whilst holding out for the cavalry to show up and save them. Austin Stoker could be John Wayne, Gary Cooper, Jimmy Stewart, Darwin Joston, Charles Bronson or Clint Eastwood. Laurie Zimmer could be Claire Trevor or Lauren Bacall. Okay, no one here could be Walter Brennan, but so what? It never got that period set in any way, but it easily could have. It's a modern urban western picture that wears its influences proudly on its sleeve, reimagined and reinvented with ferocious creative flair and vital dynamism. One of the best films of the 70s. One of the best films I've ever seen. Full stop or exclamation mark. Auspicious thanks for your time and attention. It would be great if you could strike like or didn't like, post a comment, and or subscribe to the channel if you think it's your sort of thing. Hitting the super thanks button would be just peachy, as would visiting my Patreon page and giving that possibility some thought. Meanwhile, I'm taking a little time to consider my next move after this. I might be absent for a bit. But have no fear, or have a lot of fear. I aim to return, that's the plan. And I never make idle threats, just lazy promises. Later, pilgrims.